Good afternoon, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the session on regional integration and investment promotion. We have a very crowded and busy program ahead of us in the next hour and a half. And um, we will start right away uh, with an open, with opening remarks uh, by Mr. James Sam, Director of Investment and Enterprise and Lead of the World Investment Report in Angtad. James, you have the floor. Thank you, Richard. Uh, excellencies, eminent panelists, ladies, gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our roundtable on regional integration and investment promotion. And this is jointly organized with United Nations regional commissions and we have colleagues here uh, in the panel. So regional integration continues to be uh, prominent on the global economic agenda. As of today, the World, uh, World, World Trade Organization has, has been notified of 350 uh, regional integration agreements in force, uh, a two third increase from 10 years ago. So they can be a big uh, investment uh, in investment terms. So some of the recent regional agreements, such as the Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership, the RCEP agreement, uh, make up about 15% of global FDI stocks and a third of global FDI flows. So as we have heard from many speakers at the World Investment Forum, there's widespread expectation that the international production networks will become more regional in scope. Um, that could mean intra-regional investment will grow faster in the coming years. So in fact, regional integration is expected to exchange cross-border uh, investment flows resulting from increased market size, the opening up of new sectors to investment and the policy alignment and the harmonization of rules. So there's evidence of the positive effects that regional integration efforts can have on the FDI flows within the, within the region. So for example, as mentioned in the latest ASEAN investment report prepared by ANCTA and the ASEAN Secretariat, in 2020, while total FDI flows to ASEAN fell by 25%, investment within ASEAN was resilient and, and rising by 5% uh, to 23 billion US dollars. So this, push, uh, this pushes up the intra-ASEAN share of the FDI in the region from 12% to 17%. But even with progress on harmonization of policies, increased uh, intra-regional FDI is not automatic. Regional cooperation on investment promotion can boost the prospects of, uh, of uh, integration. So, so um, this round table is very relevant in this connection. We are very pleased that so many speakers from regional economic integration organizations have joined us to share their experience and insights on FDI policies in support of regional integration. In addition, I'm keen to hear our, uh, from our colleagues in UN regional uh, commissions, ESCAP, ESQA, ECLAG, ECE, and the ECA, how they are supporting these uh, integration process in their geography and what we can do uh, and can do better together. So I wish uh, that uh, this session will be uh, a productive deliberations. Um, thank you, Richard, it's over to you. Thank you very much, James. Thank you for that introduction. Um, we have uh, indeed two sets of uh, distinguished speakers, panelists uh, with us today in this session. Um, we have uh, a series uh, of high-level representatives of regional economic integration um, or cooperation organizations. And then we have um, all of our colleagues from regional commissions. What we will do, uh, James already set out the objectives of our session. We would like to have a look at the landscape of um, regional integration and the role of FDI, foreign direct investment, in it. Um, 
and then to discuss with uh, also with colleagues what do these integration processes and FDI based or F cooperation on FDI look like um, at the regional level. So in order to do that, I'm going to um, pass the floor first to our speakers uh, representing regional economic cooperation organizations. And I would like to start uh, with Mr. Satvinder Singh, the Deputy Secretary General of the ASEAN Economic Community. Uh, Mr. Singh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, thank you to also James for the opening. And of course, thank you to Antak for giving the ASEAN Secretariat this opportunity uh, to be part of the forum. We truly believe and we are deeply committed to open economies for both trade and investments. I think you can see for yourself where many parts of the world, you can see many of them are deglobalizing for the last two, three years, erecting barriers for cross-border flows but you can see that the ASEAN member states, deep in the crisis last year, when the pandemic began, in fact, they all came together in a very resolute way in November to come together to rush and to finalize the signing of the RCEP agreement that James talked about. Of course, the agreement RCEP is the largest FTA that brought together ASEAN member countries in centrality together with five of our largest trading partners together to create one open marketplace, not only for trade, but also for investments. This kind of uh, collective integration, this kind of joint vision by the ASEAN member states, it's all collectively looking towards targeting better lives for our people while remaining relevant and connected and globally competitive. All this, all this actually attests the importance that ASEAN plays in global trade and international links. Now, you can basically see around the world, I mean, if you are attracting global investors from any part of the world, no one is going to be comfortable to invest in a country where the borders are strictly tight and you're not open or connected to the rest of the world. You know, it might, not, it might work for a very large uh, self-contained economy, economy, but even today, when you look around, some of the largest economies, they don't do that. No one is in an island. Everybody is necessarily connected. And I think as we move in our new era of our global value chains of manufacturing and in, in, in the new generation of the economies, I think this factor becomes even more critical. The need for us to be connected, the need for our markets to be open, and the need for us to be globally competitive. The ASEAN member states, they all have embraced investments as one of the core elements under our um, ASEAN uh, economic development blueprint. And the main objective has always been to further enhance ASEAN attractiveness as a destination um, for investments through ensuring that we remain open, transparent, and predictable. And to me, um, this is clearly seen from the fact that um, we ASEAN today as James had highlighted in his opening speech, is a destination that attracts a fair amount of FDI. In fact, even, even though we saw a dip of investment of 25% in 2020, ASEAN still remains one of the most formidable FDI attraction destinations in the world. And I think we are destined um, to work harder to ensure that we, we attain our attractiveness. In fact, we've been pursuing a wide range of initiatives to facilitate investments and businesses. And this actually include enhancement of our investment related laws and regulations, the simplifications of our business and investment procedures, establishing one stop shop mechanism for investment services, even building the necessary supporting infrastructures. And of course, all this becomes very important um, ever more in uh, a period where we are all recovering from the pandemic. In fact, let me quickly jump on to two important initiatives that this year uh, signal our deeper commitment towards having a stronger investment regimes. First, at the regional level, the ASEAN has adopted the ASEAN investment, um, uh, ASEAN investment facilitation framework, which is one of the priority economic deliverables this year. And it's definitely very consistent with our principles of our uh, investment uh, of our ASEAN Investment Area Council, all targeted towards creating a liberal, more facilitative, more transparent, and a competitive environment in ASEAN. While it may not be legally binding, 
I think this agreement and framework definitely is very welcomed by the business community in ASEAN. And I'm sure it's going to help us uh, in order to cope with, uh, uh, cope with uh, attracting and uh, able us to be able to attract more investments to the region. Second, I would like to end off by also sharing that we are now looking more into not just promoting investment, but also looking at ensuring sustainable investment. I think this is where I want to share that we'll be holding a forum on sustainable investment in November this year. And also we'll be working on a report with our partners on sustainable investment. I mean, this definitely is gonna be the next phase of our growth and development. We are looking forward to setting up ASEAN guidelines on sustainable investment, all intended to promote sustainable and responsible investments. As we kind of know that, you know, um, we need, we need to support recovery, but at the same time, we kind of know now that there's also a need for ASEAN to be really also achieving our SDG goals. And therefore, we will look forward uh, to being committed on these areas and definitely look forward to our partners, especially the UN agencies, to work together with you guys um, in order to help us achieve our betterment um, of our policies and our programs in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Richard. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Singh, and uh, uh, well, we'll see each other again on Monday when we present the uh, ASEAN Investment Report of this year uh, to the ASEAN Business and Investment Summit, so looking forward to that. Uh, however, I'm afraid uh, you said no one is on an island, but I have to prove you wrong right away because our next speaker, um, who I will introduce now, is uh, Mr. Henry Puna, the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat and uh, he cannot be with us uh, uh, on the, directly on Zoom, but uh, he has sent a video address, which we will now play. Thank you. Kiorana, Nisambulovinaka, and warm Pacific greetings from Suva. First, let me thank the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development for the invitation to address this forum. And congratulations for convening the seventh World Investment Forum. I am pleased to be participating in this particular session on regional integration and investment proposition. I would like to focus on two key issues. First, what are the main investment for development policy challenges? And secondly, how can regional integration in the Pacific Islands shape regional investment trends? Challenges. We have seen how the COVID-19 pandemic led to severe economic contractions in most Pacific Island countries last year. It has impacted tourism dependent countries such as Fiji and Palau, for example, which according to the Pacific Financial Technical Assistance Center has led to double-digit contractions in those economies with unweighted average real GDP contracting by an estimated 4.5%. The closure of borders has held back imports of capital goods and the arrival of foreign experts, delaying infrastructure and reconstruction efforts for many of our countries. Private sector has faced the brunt of this and tried to remain open by shifting their business interface online. Fundamental for businesses is keeping costs down, but these remain challenging given that Pacific countries generally rank poorly on the cost and ease of doing business rankings. While this may not be a perfect barometer, it does highlight and remind us of the fragility and the interconnectedness of our small markets and their remoteness. Further, it highlights the toll and impact on the public finances of our region from climate-induced disasters and other crises. Pacific countries reeled as a result of the pandemic. Fiji saw the impact of COVID-19 has been significant with revenue as a percentage of GDP falling from 27.3% in 2019 by 0.9 percentage points. And in 2020, 
a further 9.5 percentage points. According to the Asian Development Bank, total revenue in 2021 is expected to be 33.3% lower. This being caused in large part by value-added tax collections, reducing by some 8.2%, and customs duties down by 44.2%, while expenditure is projected to increase by 3.9%. Further, public debt is projected to increase to 83.4%, by the end of the financial year 2021. Pre-pandemic, several of our economies were still recovering from a series of natural disasters. Mother Nature is reminding us the impacts of climate change are well and truly here. Tropical Cyclone Winston, one of the most powerful cyclones on record, hit Fiji in 2016, causing more than 900 million US dollars in estimated damage and losses. The year prior, it was tropical cyclone Pam in Vanuatu, where damages exceeded 60% of Vanuatu's GDP, derailing the country's budget and fiscal position. According to the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, 10 countries in the Pacific are ranked among the top 30 countries in the world with the highest average annual losses as a percentage of GDP. Since 1950, tropical cyclones and earthquakes have caused over US $3 billion in estimated damage and losses in Pacific Island countries alone. The reality is that for every dollar lost to natural hazards, means $1 less for essential investments in public health, education, transportation, and more. The impacts from disasters extend far beyond communities directly affected, and the spin-off effect in these instances is equally burdening. In addressing these challenges, regionalism and regional integration offers tremendous opportunity for Pacific countries to strengthen their collective responses and intra-regional trade and investment, given our markets and geographical remoteness. Collaborating with the private sector, facilitating investments, and building on regionalism demonstrate how our members are taking ownership of our development challenges, formulating coherent policies, and building lasting relationships to address them. I would now like to touch on a number of key initiatives that demonstrate the value of regionalism in this space. The Pacific Aid for Trade Strategy 2020-2025 is our blueprint for regional trade work. Some key features in this strategy are e-commerce, quality infrastructure, trade facilitation, all offering comprehensive connectivity to promote and facilitate Pacific trade and private sector development. Leveraging off e-commerce means overcoming distance and cost and provides a cost-effective platform for Pacific businesses to expand their global market reach and realize the untapped potential. The Pacific Resilience Facility, a regional financing facility to help build Pacific resilience in the face of more frequent and severe disasters and ongoing climate change threats. And this requires investments upfront, including opportunities in renewable energy, in smart agriculture, green investment, and others. And thirdly, Looking at the mechanisms for integration and trading agreements and investment opportunities, the Secretariat is undertaking a comprehensive review of Pacific Island countries' trade arrangements in order to modernize and reinvigorate the regional trade architecture. I wish to also stress the importance of ensuring that legislation and investment promotion policies and regulations attract investments, but also provide seamless channels of administration 
for their establishment and operations. More private sector investment financing facilities are needed in our region. Businesses need access to blended finance vehicles. For example, combining donor funding to crowd in private finance into the renewable energy sector. Tourism, fisheries, and agriculture are our most competitive industries and are key drivers of economic growth. The ICT's telecommunications market and energy and construction are also opportunities to enhance investment and innovation. Next steps. As I conclude, I take this opportunity to again thank you for the invitation. I look forward to the outcomes, especially where they complement our own regional efforts and we, which we could enact via the memorandum of understanding that exists between UNCTAD and the Pacific Islands Forum. On that note, metaki mata, vinaka waka levu, and thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kuna, for this statement. Um, uh, I will move on uh, immediately to our third uh, speaker, um, representing the uh, Andean community, Secretariat of the Andean community. Uh, Mr. Pedras, the Secretary General, could not be with us, but we have, I see online, uh, Mr. Diego Caicedo, uh, General Director of the Secretariat of the Andean community. The floor is yours, Mr. Caicedo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks a lot for this invitation and to have the opportunity to share the vision of the Andean community in this forum. Okay, the, the Andean community is uh, one of the oldest integration initiatives in Latin America. We are a regional group formed by Col Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. This year, we have celebrated uh, 52 years of existence and with several milestones that have been achieved in that period of time, of time such as the existence of a free trade zone, free movement of Andean citizens without requiring a visa, or reduction of the cost of roaming in the subregion, among others. From an institutional point of view, it is also worth highlighting the broad community acquis with more than 800 Andean decisions that are supranational in nature and that emulate some way the directives of the uh, European Union. In this context, we work on promote integration beyond of trade, covering topics such as services, digital development, the promotion of competitiveness and investment. In terms of uh, investment, the Indian community members countries, after that external debt crisis in the mid 80s, unilaterally adopted measures aimed at uh, promoting and strength foreign direct investment through the freedom to establish investment policies in this uh, in our legislation, national laws, and the warranty of the principle of no discrimination. Already adopted uh, some laws in, in this context. These initiatives were, were ratified by Andean community in a, a, 19, in 91, through decisions 291, created with the objective of removing obstacles for a foreign investment and a, to, to promote the free circulation of subregional sub capital, stimulating the flow of the foreign capital and technologies to Andean economies. And we have another decision, 292, a, the idea of the objective of this uh, decision is update and improve the regimen on an, and the multinational companies to preserve and stimulate the association of national investors in the member countries for these uh, projects or share interest in multinational scope. However, as you know, in 2020, the pandemic had a strong negative effect of the investment of uh, transnational companies in the sub-region. The Andean country received $11 billion 
from foreign uh, direct investment, which represents some $13 billion less than uh, 2019. Thus, in 2020, the lowest value of the last decade uh, we reached. And the, and the year on year decline is only comparable to that of uh, uh, 2009, when inflows fell a uh, 19% as a result of the international final financial crisis. As uh, you know, uh, the FDI consists in the uh, inflow of investment to obtain uh, management control of companies, the operating country, other than the, of the investors. In the case of Andean community, this inflow of foreign capital has remained um, average FDI between uh, uh, 211 and 219 was an annual average uh, is um, uh, $25 billion. But despite the situation, it's important to highlight where these investments have been uh, directed. Traditional companies have uh, set up in the region to participate in sector as a uh, natural resource, especially mining and petroleum. But we have another sectors in order to generate export activities. For example, trading services, manufacturing to supply in the region. And today we have many projects with investment and infrastructure of clean energies, products with value, uh, added value services. In 2020, uh, is a year uh, marked by pandemic. The most affected investment, uh, especially manufacturing, tourism, and other sectors. Uh, but the region, uh, the idea is in, in this year uh, and next uh, year to, to, to obtain uh, or improve our shifts, uh, our numbers in investment. Today, and the Andean communities are recent years, I generate rules and regulations in order to improve the investment regime. With the creation of the investment protection laws, with the investment contracts of legal stability international, and some agreements uh, related with promotion and uh, protection of investment and international agreements of taxation. In, the, in this sense, the Andean countries through uh, our uh, agencies of promotion and investment, we have uh, generated various policies to attract more direct investment related with uh, tax incentives, uh, such as tax benefits, uh, for example, exemption from income tax, exemption to a, a acquisition of capital goods or foreign exchange income for investment financial incentives such as improved, improved in credits, reduction of requirements or uh, credit guarantees. Finally, the introduction to, of approach in the future, the idea is coordinate, uh, coordinate uh, in the region uh, more initiatives uh, in order to have uh, and strong uh, regulations to improve uh, our investment in the region. Thank you very much. I realized I was still muted there. Thank you so much um, for that contribution. Um, I will move on immediately um, to our next speaker. And we're moving to, we're staying on the same continent. Um, I'm going to pass the floor to Ms. Uh, Desiree Garcia, Executive Director of the Secretariat for Central American Economic Integration. Ms. Garcia, you have the floor. Did we lose someone? One moment. I think we pass on because I do not see her on my screen. I think she was there earlier. Um, so I will move on then to, uh, well, then in that case, we switch continent. Um, Mr. Djikic, Mr. Emir Djikic, Director, Central European Free Trade Agreement Secretariat. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you for that for the invitation to participate at this conference. Uh, basically, 
I'm representing as a secretariat of the parties uh, that are that main goal is to extinguish itself upon the parties joining the European Union. So basically, we are in different positions as uh, as basically we are celebrating today 15 years of our uh, accession processes towards the EU, where CEFTA is one of the uh, outcomes. And uh, basically, in the last period, uh, or in the first period of existence of the agreement, we have uh, tackled the, the issues of the trade, EA, the customs tariffs, and uh, since 2015, we are customs-free region, which is increasing the potential for the investments. As well, all of the parties are members of the pan europe Med Convention, and uh, one of the decisions which we adopted this year is the revision of the Pan-Euromed Pan uh, Convention that uh, imp implements the transitional rules within the CEFTA, which attracts as well the part of the investment. As well, during the 2021, I mean, I, I wish to say that we were first in 2018, one of the first to have uh, drafted the, together with looked at uh, the investment policy review of the uh, Southeast European of CEFTA parties. And uh, basically, we are planning to repeat this activity uh, during the next year. We were thinking to do it earlier, but we were uh, not being enabled to do it because of the pandemics. In the regional context, uh, in the regional context, we are working together with uh, several other organizations that are forming a pool of the organizations that are dealing with the. Uh, with the Western Balkan regions, namely the RCC, uh, Regional Cooperation Council, the Transport Community, and uh, the newest, the newest of the organizations, which is, in my personal view, and uh, I presume that it could be a good uh, and positive uh, aspect for everybody, is that uh, the regional West, uh, Western Balkans Six Chamber Investment Forum that uh, established a uh, regional organization of uh, chambers of commerce who are actively participating in the activities and of, of, of all the above mentioned organ of the all above mentioned organizations and are providing the views of the industries and uh, uh, providing their opinions in the work of the of of of, of the regional organizations in in uh, western balkans as well the part of the investment uh, uh, is covered uh, partial by the SAIC and uh, partially so by RCC and the uh, joint working groups between CEFTA and RCC. And uh, in 2018, we had uh, established the RIRA Regional Investment Reform Agenda, where each of the CEFTA, uh, where each of the Western Balkan Six had uh, to harmonize their investment policies within the, uh, within the national framework. And basically this is at the moment in progress, but it was, uh, it had a damage as everything else by the pandemics that raised in uh, early, early uh, 2000, was it 2020? Early 2020, where uh, almost everything was stopped and most of us at the moment concentrated to enable uh, to enable su steady supply of the food and feed and the medicines uh, to the region. This was predominantly done uh, through the Green Corridors, which probably you have uh, heard about the initiative that was established in, within Western Balkans, where the waiting times on the borders were completely diminished for some sorts of goods that were of the first necessities and where we enabled, where we enabled the region to be sustainable in the uh, in, uh, food and feed, uh, animal feed and uh, medicines. In 2021, the entry into force of the agreement on services is providing, uh, in January 2021, is providing an additional field and additional incentive for the, uh, for the investment. And basically the decisions which are coming out of it, such as uh, one of the e-commerce e that should be ready today towards the end of the year, we will establish the new areas of the potential investments. As well, all of this is followed by the EU uh, economic and investment plan that is, uh, in, in their view, trying to incorporate some of the areas of the, uh, of the, uh, of the areas that are com 
compatible with the EU acquis to the single market of the EU, which is of the extreme importance at the moment for the Western Balkans, considering that 73% uh, of the trade is ongoing with the EU. Related to the uh, investment in the last policies, what we are trying to do is to harmonize the standards for the uh, investment treaties that are uh, that are prepared by the uh, CERTA parties or uh, Western Balkan uh, economies. And uh, what we have done, we have selected the priorities for the regional investment uh, promotion. That uh, that would be that would be done uh, during the next couple of years. It's automotive industry where we are a big exporter and big big, big uh, tradition already of the automotive industries, uh, and we are trying to uh, enter into the post-pandemic uh, global value chains in order to uh, raise the exports and uh, basically uh, improve the foreign direct investment. So in the previous years, you had some of the huge investments in automotive industries, which are now consist considering more, mostly the 25% of the exports of some parties uh, in, in the framework of the global value chains. And we are doing everything uh, to uh, enable, uh, enable the, steady, the, steady work, uh, the steady work of those investments here. That's why the Pan-Euro Mediterranean Convention that we adopted immediately, this is why we try to uh, establish the green, green lanes with the European Union to establish the uh, just-in-time uh, possibility of the production of the investors, and uh, in the in the sense of the promotion, the uh, Western Balkans KIF and RCC together have launched the uh, database, the database of the the database of the incentives that are given by each of the parties, and in the next period we're going to try to harmonize as well those kinds of things until we reach the main goal, uh, uh, one uh, investment protection agreement at the end on the policy level. So to mix it up, to finish it with the policy level, uh, that, should, that should replace the current uh, inventory, the current setup of the uh, investment protection treaties that we have in the region. So basically that would be brief. I hope that I was in the five minutes. I don't want to steal any more of your time. And of course, we are open for all kinds of questions. Thank you so much. That was uh, perfectly within within the margin. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I believe we do not have Ms. Garcia, so I think that concludes then our first round of speakers representing the Regional Economic Cooperation Organization. Um, now, um, I think we've heard some, some common themes, um, but also some differences. Right, so a, a common theme that I've heard multiple heard multiple times is on investment facilitation and the investment facilitation framework. We heard from Mr. Singh, we heard investment uh, facilitation from uh, Mr. Puna, um, and some activities also in the last uh, 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 from Mr. Jikic here. Um, but we heard also various differences. We heard some um, focus more on the harmonization of uh, investment uh, agreements, investment protection agreements in the last uh, case. And uh, Mr. Jigas, you also focused on targeted promotion at the regional level. So uh, that's kind of moving from um, uh, competing on for investment to work, working together to target investment in a specific sector, in your case, automotive. And of course, uh, um, you know, putting a database on incentives together works towards that same direction. It's, uh, it's, it's moving away from, from, um, from zero sum to, to joint promotion. So I think these were interesting uh, similar areas in common and interesting differences. Um, we will come back to that if you have uh, time to continue to follow and, uh, and uh, come back to a second round of questions, that would be great. But I will pass on now to my colleagues in the UN regional commissions who uh, each uh, do work in the area of investment and uh, each contribute to economic integration initiatives and efforts in their regions. So I'd like to hear their perspectives. Um, and I would like to start, if I can please, with Mr. Munir Tabet, uh, Deputy Executive Secretary of uh, United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. Mr. Tabet, you have the floor. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation to participate in this important panel. 
I am asked to speak on the topic of regional integration in the Arab region and the role of FDI in this regard. Arguments in favor of Arab regional economic integration have been made and reiterated many times since the independence era. As a regional UN organization whose key mandate is promoting regional integration, ESCO has contributed significantly to these arguments in all domains, economic, social, environmental. In 2014, three years after the Arab Spring, we undertook a comprehensive evidence-based analysis and called for a deeper regional integration resting on several pillars. I will only mention two deeper economic integration to reap benefits for all Arab countries and more extensive educational cultural reform to encourage and enable Arab knowledge societies to thrive. Since then, we have followed up with three assessments of progress in 2015, 2018, and 2020. The main conclusion is clear. Despite some progress on the integration pathway, the region continues to operate below its potential, both in terms of sustainable growth and in terms of benefits to be realized from a deeper and more advanced regional integration. To be sure, conflict has been an impediment, but also political hesitancy may have contributed to the current level of integration. Economic integration has always been open for interpretation and this interpretation has fallen somewhere between a simple customs arrangement between two or more neighboring countries on one end of the scale and full unification on the other end. Yet, there has always been understanding among Arab decision makers that economic integration and complementarity of comparative advantages is highly desirable. However, the mechanics of it the necessary political preconditions and the attendant implications have not yet been fully and sufficiently explored to give an adequate satisfactory argument to motivate decision makers to proceed with a full-fledged pan-Arab integration project, even if considerable progress has been made with such arrangements at a more restricted level, such as the GCC, post the pan-Arab free trade agreement, PAFTA, would have been another area of success had its implementation been facilitated and gradually revised and modernized to make it relevant to the reality of regional economic integration and globalization. Like every other region in the world, conditions have been evolving to make Arab economic integration more of a necessity today than ever before. While the pressure to act has come from domains such as climate change, particularly rising water depravity and constraints of joint responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, including vaccines and labor movement, opportunities for greater integration have been spotlighted by economic imperatives and by the technology advances, significantly facilitating integration when the decision to do so is taken. Digital technology, e-commerce, banking, finance, transboundary energy and electricity sh sharing and even transport have all been positive motives to advance even further on the pathway of regional integration. Yet, even as the technical, con technical conditions continue to ripen, the evidence on the ground are insufficiently encouraging. Let me share some figures. In 2019, the Arab region's exports were nearly 1 trillion. That's about 5% of world exports and imports were around 828 billion, about 4% of world exports, imports. In 2020, exports were estimated to have declined by 88 billion and imports by 111 billion. On the decline in exports, 74 billion was as a result of a decline in world exports, as one would expect. But 14 billion as a decline in intra-Arab exports. Clearly, the potential, these figures point to the fact that potential for intra-Arab trade is much bigger than is currently being realized. In terms of FDI, in 2020, the inflows into the region reached 40 billion. This is a decline from an estimated peak of 88 billion in 2008. Outflows, outflows for the same year, that is 2020, reached 31 billion. That's also a decline 
from an estimated peak of 44 billion in 2008. Granted, the peak inflows and outflows that I have mentioned are obviously a pre-2008-2009 crisis level. But the main point here is that the Arab region continues to be a net exporter of capital. We estimate that between 2011 and 2019, for every dollar received in FDI, $1.5 left the region. Indeed, as a proportion of GDP, FDI flows into the region over the past 10 years have underperformed the average um, for advanced economies, emerging markets, and developing economies. The bulk of those FDIs that do flow into the region continue to go into energy, real estate, a good portion of it is speculative, financial services, and consumer products. Not enough is being invested in real value-adding, job-creating sectors that underpin equitable, sustainable development outcomes, therefore linking FDI to development as the main theme of this conversation. In addition to perceived political instability and prevalence of conflict, the main impediments of FDI as a catalyst to regional integration include some external global factors such as the rising risk aversion of FDIs in general, fiscal incentives designed to encourage investments in rich countries, particularly benefiting sovereign wealth funds, including those that originate from our region. And until recently, a general trend of decline in commodity prices, including crude oil, metals, and minerals. There are other factors, including insufficient diversification of the Arab economies that are still tied to unpredictably um, and at times vulnerable oil prices. While when these prices are low, they drive home the point of the need for greater integration. But when they are high, they form a disincentives, even if temporary. There are also lack of real financially rewarding investments outside the rapidly saturating real estate sector and the unreliable post-conflict reconstruction sector. Absence of an annual integrated Arab investment promotion strategy is another factor, one that builds on national strategies where they exist, underscoring complementarities, opportunities, and facilitating measures. The picture, however, is not too gloomy. It does look a little bit brighter. To facilitate FDI inflows and investment, almost all Arab countries have successfully put in practice new investment laws that facilitate foreign ownership of, comp of companies in several sectors. This includes fiscal risk mitigation, insurance, ownership, and competition policies. Much also has been done to increase confidence in and attractiveness of the Arab region to FDI, including through lowering the cost of starting businesses, introducing large-scale trade investment facilitation reforms, updating investment and company laws, improved a protection of foreign shareholders. Uh, some countries have taken. Mr. Tabet. Yes, I will Thank try you. and conclude. Thank you. Yes. So let me conclude with some remarks on issues to consider as the region moves forward. Recovering from the COVID 19 pandemic represents an opportunity to build forward better. Domestic investments designed to help the recovery have an important opportunity to address some of the historical structural challenges while also meeting new ones. This is truly the opportunity for policies to diversify the region's economy, to encourage investment in job creation, and so on. I'm going to speed through the remaining aspects and just say that in response to the major challenges facing the region, ESCO is committed to working together in solidarity with countries. To that end, we have developed a number of agile online policy simulation platforms that member states can utilize, as well as initiatives that help decision makers in a number of ways. I will, remember, I will only mention a few. Better, so there are tools, simulation tools, online interactive to better assess the impact of economic reforms, as well as external shocks as a major input into prioritizing and undertaking such reforms a tool that tracks and compares the performance of member states on the international indicators related to competitiveness. Other ones that relate to enhancing regional transport and trade connectivities. 
as well as strengthening Arab exports through facilitating and promoting connectivity to global value chains. Finally, there are a couple that deal with final facilitating the exchange of best practices and experiences on quantitative tools used in trade policy analysis, as well as exploring uh, added options for financing, including climate SDG debt swaps, and more effectively assessing the efficiency of allocation of social spending. I will stop here at this moment. Thank you very thank much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Talbot. And, uh, and thank you again also. We have had several um, uh, um, interesting um, collaborations in the past with policy briefings on our world investment reports to your, uh, to your audiences. So very helpful. And thank you for your intervention. I will move on rapidly. And I would ask uh, Mr. Um, uh, Mario Castillo um, Astudio to, um, to intervene next, uh, the Director of International Trade and Integration Division, Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Mr. Castillo, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Distinguished uh, colleague, uh, and good morning also for Latin American uh, country. On behalf of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I would like to, to share an, uh, uh, an a brief uh, uh, presentation. Uh, it's uh, related how can regional integration foster uh, FDI development in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, of course, in a few minutes, I, I, I would like to present uh, some facts. Uh, we organize in three elements. Uh, first, I, I will present some uh, uh, the, 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 the trend of F FDI in Latin America. Uh, second, and we focus in the, in the regional integration. That is an, a, an, a, an a purity in terms of the, of the work of the ICLA with Latin American country. And finally, uh, I will give you uh, some final uh, 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 reflection. Okay, in this chart, uh, I think that there are two main uh, messages. One of them is uh, foreign direct investment is, is important for Latin, Latin American country. In the, in the last uh, decade, uh, Latin America uh, received uh, uh, about 12% of the world uh, FDI inflow. Uh, it's, uh, it's above uh, 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 related to uh, the, the share of the world GDP. Uh, that is uh, around 6%. Uh, that means that the FDI doubled the importance of the GDP in the, in the region. Uh, however, uh, we, uh, we can see that the, the evolution uh, is, uh, is related with a, a cycle, mainly related with the cycle of the price of national resources. Uh, the, the boom of the commodity price uh, is, is a result the uh, very uh, high level of uh, foreign direct investment between 2011 and 2014. And after that, it's reduced uh, significantly. And other, other elements you can see in the in 2020, of course, during the, the pandemic crisis, the uh, FDI uh, fall. Uh, 35% uh, uh, in the region, very uh, high reduce. In terms of the, the uh, dynamic in the region, uh, three elements, Brazil and Mexico is the most important economy that receive the, the investment. Mexico and Central America is more related with the integration with North America. South America, as I, as I mentioned, is, is related with the, the, the local market and also national resources with the European investor uh, as an, a leader. In the Caribbean, it has an important in terms of tourism, that is the main driver in, in terms of, of uh, FDI. Uh, in, in terms of the source of the foreign direct investment, uh, uh, Europe and the US are, 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 are 
are by far for the largest foreign investor. Uh, however, if you can see the relevance of the, the, the regional foreign direct investment is very low. Uh, the, the foreign direct investment for Latin American countries mainly focus in, in Central America. And this is the reason that this is one of the, the, the elements of the, our world for Latin American uh, country. As the sale of uh, FDI, the interregional trade also represents uh, as, as a more part of the total trade. As you can see, uh, there is a uh, reduction uh, since uh, 2014 and the participation of the trade in the region also related with the, with the FDI also is uh, mainly related with the cycle of the natural resources. And this is uh, the, the, the reason that we think that the uh, FDI joined with the trade uh, has to be an important uh, element in terms of, of reactivation of our economy, but also in terms of the integration. And as a final uh, message, I, I would like to emphasize um, and we have uh, to move forward in terms of the FDI, but also in terms of the trade with the main mechanism of the integration in Latin America. That means with Mercosur, with uh, Pacific Islands, uh, uh, Mercado Andino, uh, uh, with the other uh, mechanism. Uh, uh, the problem is that the mechanism remains fragmented in several blocks. Uh, this is the, the idea that we're working with several mechanisms in terms of the uh, 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 develop and, and propose an agenda that uh, can harmonize regulation and also converge in, 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 in some element. And, uh, and finally, uh, one of the, the elements that we propose is uh, the important to relate uh, FDI trade in, in a strategic industry. That means that we are working in a strategic industry like pharmaceutical, uh, medical device, digital industry, uh, electromobility, uh, renewable energy. Uh, this is one of the, our priority in terms of the promotion and the idea to coordinate the different initiative, uh, public policies, and also uh, strategies that are in place in several uh, countries. And finally, we are, uh, uh, we are clear that uh, this kind of initiative we, uh, we have to put in the, uh, in the framework of the industrial policy. Uh, where uh, FDI uh, has to be an important uh, element uh, and also is more related to uh, facilitation, but also would create a new capability. And I think that this is the main element that uh, we're working in, in, in ICLAC and also with different Latin American countries. Okay, and I would like to thank the invitation and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mario. Um, that's really that's really great, and the strategic direction there for uh, for uh, how to uh, how to accelerate regional integration through FDI is, is very helpful. And I would like to uh, uh, give um, uh, later on, if we have if we manage to leave some time to come back to these points, and including with perhaps um, a question from Mr. Caicedo, if uh, if he. Uh, um, I'm sure that looking at this presentation, he might want to, uh, to pose a question on this. So let's uh, speed up quickly and just go through and we have questions uh, time at the end. Um, so I'll pass the floor now to Ms. Rupa Chanda, Director of Trade Investment Innovation Division of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Um, you, you have the floor, Ms. Chanda. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. And I thank Antat for this opportunity. Uh, let me briefly just outline some of the key trends in FDI in the region. As we're all aware, the Asia-Pacific region is a key player in both global and intra-regional FDI flows. 
And in fact, it is, uh, it is the main recipient uh, region accounting for 54% of global FDI flows. It's also the main source of FDI globally. Uh, of course, there are several reasons for this. One is China's dominance as a developing country recipient of FDI, as well as as a source of FDI. Uh, and of course, uh, as was mentioned earlier by another speaker, the fact that many member countries in this region have actually liberalized their FDI policies, improved their investment climate, and are parties to a variety of regional as well as bilateral agreements where they have committed to opening up their markets to trade and investment flows. A very important aspect of this region's FDI flows is the growth in intra-regional FDI, especially greenfield FDI, which has increased steadily since the 2000s. In fact, they reached an all-time high of $200 billion in 2018 and accounted for nearly half of all FDI inflows to the region. Um, the main recipient, again, sub-regions within this are the ASEAN member countries, and the main sources are the East and Northeast Asian countries, as well as some Southeast Asian sub-regional uh, members. So what emerges very clearly is that there's both inward flows from the rest of the world, but there's a lot of flows from within the region as well. Now, these trends in intra-regional FDI really reflect a close link between regional integration, especially intra-regional trade, which is quite high in some parts of the Asia Pacific, and FDI flows. For instance, the growth in intra-regional trade in parts and components industries in industries like electronics, automotives, machinery, which have been enabled by unilateral, bilateral, and regional trade liberalization has in turn spurred investments to this region from the rest of the world and also from within the region. In turn, these FDI flows have enabled the development of regional production networks and regional value chains and influenced regional integration. So basically there's a synergy between what's happening with FDI as well as trade. Uh, if one takes ASEAN subregion, trade liberalization among ASEAN member states has expanded the regional market and enhanced its attractiveness as a destination for international as well as intra-regional investments. So there's a close nexus, as I mentioned, between regional trade and investment trends in the Asia Pacific. However, not all the subregions have experienced these trends. South Asia, for instance, remains very poorly integrated with low levels of intra-regional trade and investment and has underperformed relative to its potential in attracting FDI. Falling from the peak of $200 billion to $138 billion in 2019 and further to $65 billion in 2020. And intra-regional FDI flows are unlikely to recover in 2021, as some of the traditionally large source countries like China, Japan, Korea have been hit by further waves of the COVID-19 pandemic. So while effective response and recovery measures combined with regional and global vaccine rollouts would eventually help in a rebound in FDI levels, it'll take time to come back to pre-COVID-19 levels, and there's also a lot of risk aversion. But there are some positive forces, and regional integration is one of them. There's also the increased adoption of digital technologies post the pandemic, which could spur growth in digital FDI. And we're seeing some of that, especially in telecommunications and ICT services sectors. Investment provisions under mega regionals such as RCEP and CPTPP, in which many of the member countries participate, could also help in attracting FDI and member LDCs to integrate into and move up in regional value chains. But overall, I would say that the outlook remains challenging. There are of course long-standing challenges, such as poor business environment, trade barriers, lack of trade facilitation, and lack of harmonization in international investment agreements. So there are a lot of overlapping international agreements which exist in the region alongside national investment laws and bilateral investment treaties, which create legal complexity. So one of the areas going forward would be to try and harmonize some of these arrangements. There are also, of course, skill infrastructure and technology related constraints, which continue to impede FDI in the region. Uh, let me briefly just mention what ESCAP has been doing to address some of these FDI related challenges. We have been providing extensive support to member states under four broad categories of activities. The first is capacity building to enable member states to attract investment, particularly in new areas such as the digital economy. We've just concluded a series of national capacity building workshops in Bhutan, Mongolia, and Pakistan with investment promotion agencies in each country. The second broad area of work is technical assistance to help member states develop FDI strategies, which would enable them to recover from COVID. We're currently working in Mongolia with the National Development Agency to develop their FDI strategy and are in discussions with several other member states. 
Our third area of work is creation and dissemination of knowledge products. In this context, we've recently launched an outward FDI policy toolkit. We have other products such as handbook on policies, promotion and facilitation of sustainable FDI and sustainable FDI indicators. And the fourth area of work is the SKEP FDI Policymakers Network, which enables member states to connect and share their knowledge and experiences in attracting, promoting, and facilitating FDI. We organize annual meetings of the network and organize regular capacity building workshops to address AI policy themes such as digital FDI and investment facilitation in trade agreements. We're also engaged with regional groupings such as ASEAN and APTA and have been actively engaged in trade facilitation and connectivity initiatives. So we support regional integration process in trade, which are key to investments in the region. Um, we have been working very closely with a variety of UN organizations, for instance, the UN uh, RCs in our member states to de deliver these capacity building workshops. We are working with UNECE through the UN Special Program for Economies of Central Asia. We also partner with other organizations such as the World Economic Forum and German Development Institute. In future, we hope to build on these collaborative efforts because I think it will help us to deliver more effective technical and capacity building assistance to member states. Uh, let me highlight three areas where I think there are possibilities for more one UN collaboration. The first is to work with UN regional commissions UNCTAD and the UNRCs to develop a platform that can support investment collaboration among governments to share knowledge and best practices and increase understanding of new areas such as digital FDI. The second is to work together as one UN and support other ongoing initiatives to prepare countries in special situations to identify, prepare and pitch investment proposals. A third promising area would be to develop and offer investment promotion courses on specific topics at the regional and national levels. Going forward, we believe that FDI related efforts in partnership with other UN agencies would need to focus on one capacity building to support investment facilitation and development of national action plans for related domestic reforms. B, developing tools to promote FDI in new sectors. C, developing indicators to assess the impact of investment on sustainable development and D, incorporating SDGs and an SDG lens into investment agreements, as well as ongoing discussions on investment. So I'll conclude by once again highlighting the critical role FDI plays in economic development in this region and its synergies with other regional integration processes. ESCAP recognizes this criticality and these synergies and has been actively working not only to promote and facilitate FDI, but also to use it as a vehicle for sustainable development and regional cooperation. We look forward to continued work in this area in collaboration with UN partner agencies and other organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rupa. Um, that was very helpful. And it's good to hear about uh, the, the plans going forward on, uh, um, on the direction of, uh, of ASCAP work in this area. Thank you so much. Um, I will pass now to uh, Stephen, uh, Mr. Stephen Karingi, Director of Regional Integration and Trade Division of United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Stephen, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Good afternoon. Good evening, uh, everyone. Um, so I will not uh, tackle the question of how regional integration in Africa, especially the AFCFT has uh, shaped regional investment trades over the past year and how it is going to affect in the future. Rather, I would want to deal with the two questions, the, the remaining two questions that had been sent to us. The first one being what we see as the main investment for development policy challenges in Africa. So perhaps the most important investment for development policy challenge is the disconnect between the national, sub-regional and continental levels of regulation. Uh, we can overcome this challenge uh, through the, the African continental free trade area. And I'm saying this because I take it for granted that the African continental free trade area investment protocol, which is going to be negotiated in the second phase of the negotiation, has the potential to boost FDI by harmonizing rules and creating a level playing field for investors. So here at the ECA, we have been very supportive of the agenda of the AFCFTA uh, through several approaches, 
which are meant to deal with this disconnect between the national, sub-regional, and continental levels of regulation. So how have we done that? First, we have uh, advanced the dialogue on the international investment agreement reforms through our policy research. We have provided advice on how to ensure there is great coherence in investment regulation, advocating, of course, for a level playing field for all investors. This can only happen if we eliminate the different and various levels of investment protection that puts some investors at an advantage over others. The ECEA is of the view that the African continental free trade area can be instrumental in this regard. The first two negotiations of the African continental free trade area encompasses investment, intellectual property, and competition, and can ensure alignment among these issues, as well as with trade, which is already covered in the existing uh, agreement. The phase two protocols can make an important step towards greater harmonization and coherence of investment related rules among individual African countries. Furthermore, against the backdrop of the pandemic, Africa has come to realize the importance of fast tracking electronic commerce. Indeed, many countries within the continent were able to innovate and even flourish despite the constraints of lockdowns and trade disruptions. Our, our recent publication on the common investment area indeed highlights how some companies have been able to thrive by developing new business models through e-commerce during COVID. However, e-commerce remains a challenge because in many instances, it is either regulated or not regulated at all. This means that fiscal revenue as a source of digital trade, as a result of digital trade, is probably also punching below its weight. And there may be other market inefficiencies, such as absence of consumer protection and poor cybersecurity. Market failures arising from the sector will ultimately also mean that investment in the sector will not uh, reap its full potential. And it is here the AFCFTA can again play a crucial role by providing blanket type rules on e-commerce through the protocol that is planned. Of course, the African Union has realized this and so fast tracking the negotiations of an e-commerce protocol and uh, together with phase three issues is going to happen. And negotiations in the coming months are also expected to start not only on investment, but also on the other protocols uh, I have mentioned. Last but not least, overcoming this challenge will require for member states uh, to transpose and domesticate the protocols. The Economic Commission for Africa has been supporting member states and regional economic communities in the design of national and regional AFCFTA implementation strategies. As we support the design, inclusive adoption and evolution of these uh, strategies, we are also going to mainstream investment and other phase two and three issues to ensure consistency and alignment with the protocols as we have been advocating for through our analytical work on the common investment area. So let me now spend a minute or two, Richard, to talk about what we consider to be good investment related policies, practices, and technical cooperation activities that can be replicated across the regional groupings. Of course, uh, learning also from the other uh, regions. Among the efforts we have been supporting has been substantial work on investment facilitation. Indeed, we held a high level roundtable earlier this year with the AFCFT Secretariat, the African Union Commission, the World Economic Forum, uh, the International Trade Center and DAI and other, and other parties. Investment facilitation is an area where a lot of work is being done and can be done from a regional perspective. We have garnered a wealth of experience over the years, also in partnership with ANCTAD through the development of electronic investment guides in several African countries. There is an important catalog of investment facilitation measures and practices, including investment aftercare services, 
which we consider to be of high value and usage within and across regions. Indeed, from the roundtable that we had, we were able to have a sense of several emerging experiences and best practices which investment stakeholders, such as investment protection uh, in, in investment promotion authorities, line ministries, and also regional economic communities have been utilizing to advance greater investment attraction and promotion. So as we advance the work that we've been doing, Richard, on uh, electronic guides, we are also now looking at these uh, virtual platforms as doors to the wider sub-regional and continental market in Africa. This is to say that countries need to start using the regional lens when positioning themselves as attractive investment destinations in their respective regional economic community and the wider AFCFTA common market. The policy attention now we believe uh, should be to shift from what I have to offer as a single country. It is more about what I can offer in the context of regional value chains and wider regional consumer markets once the investment protocol offers regulation which levels the playing field both for domestic, intra-regional and third party investors. So finally, the AFCFTA, uh, yeah, yeah, 30 seconds, the AFCFTA has come here to stay, becoming a must for the continent development and structural transformation. And we believe it offers a unique opportunity for Africa to promote investments, both intra-regional and from the rest of the world. So we hope that um, uh, the, the community that is listening to us here will work, of course, together with us especially as we try to bring the coherence between investment policy, competition policy, intellectual property, and e-commerce in support of the AFCFTA and regional integration in the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks. Um, very good to hear the uh, African perspective on this. And we've come to our last speaker, um, which is Ms. Elizabeth Turk, the Director of Economic Cooperation and Trade, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Richard. And let me start by congratulating Amtad's investment division for pulling off such a highly successful World Investment Forum. I think it's the seventh in a row. And uh, I guess the last four days, they've really shown that there is a desire for having a global forum that deals with investment for sustainable development. Now, from the UNECE side, it's great pleasure for me to be part of that. UNECE membership covers 56 states in the pan-European region that's spanning from North America, US, Canada, over the geographical core of Europe until Turkey in the South and Central Asia in the East. So that's definitely a vast geographical space. And amongst our 56 member states, we do have lots of developed economies and they are part of very well-known important regional integration mechanisms, the US MCA, the NUNAFTA, CETA, the EU FTA, but many countries uh, in UNEC membership, they are countries with economies in transition. And also they are part of important regional integration mechanisms. And it was a great pleasure for me to listen before already to the presentation by the SAFTA Secretariat. And I couldn't agree more with the important uh, references to investment, trade facilitation, green corridors and e-commerce that were made by our colleague from the SAFTA Secretariat. Now, let me mention here two more regional integration mechanisms or platforms in the region. One of them is the Eurasian Economic Union, maybe not so well known, but the member states here are Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and the Russian Federation. And what you do have in the Eurasian Economic Union, you actually do have a legal regime with a dedicated chapter providing equal treatment to foreign and domestic investors. So I would say that's, that's also an important mechanism to look at. And thirdly, uh, and uh, also very interesting mechanism mentioned by, by Rupa just before, that is SPECA, the United Nations Special Program for Economies in Central Asia. So what we have here is not really a legal regime, but we have a mechanism. We have a platform for regional cooperation, for a region that is actually today in the spotlight of the world's attention, namely Central Asia. And the membership there is Afghanistan, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. And it's interesting that uh, to see the extent to which in this forum there will also maybe be a, a focus on investment. 
Now, the examples I've given are, are very different in terms of the legal integration regimes. And uh, I guess one of the key questions is what has the impact, what has been the impact of this regional con configuration on, on FDI flows? And in his opening remarks, Mr. Shan today, he, he mentioned how regional integration is expected to enhance cross-border investment flows. So we do have some empirical evidence here, but I would say evidence particularly for the regional integration mechanisms in transition economies is still scarce and at, time, at times ambitious. And I'm looking to colleagues in UNCTAD here saying that clearly more research is needed to improve our understanding how have these regional integration mechanisms supported FDI flows in the transition economies. What we do know, however, is that transition economies have been hit hard by the pandemic. And I think the UNCTAD World Investment Report says that uh, transition economies have actually been hit harder than most of the regions. The inflows shrank by more than half to their lowest level. So the pandemic has really exposed many pre-existing vulnerabilities. Now, what does this mean for the future? Where can we go from here and what can we as UN agencies do together? Where can we join hands? And I think we are all striving towards a resilient, inclusive and sustainable recovery. And in UNECE, we give particular importance to a circular economy being part of that recovery. Our membership just earlier this year has mentioned circular economy, has adopted it as one of the key priority team themes for our work. Let me flag three opportunities for cooperation where investment and FDI can help us achieve these objectives. First of all, GVC linkages, the linkages between trade and investment. And it's clear that GVC linkages, they have created challenges in the pandemic, but the linkages between trade and investment, they also create important opportunities. And I think several speakers have referred to that. That's really important for us in the UNECE, particularly as several of our member states are still in the process of working on their accession to the World Trade Organization. We're gonna look increasingly into that. We start with a regional focus on resilient, inclusive and sustainable value chains in the Eurasian region. Secondly, remaining with value chains, it's very important to look at the sustainability dimension of these value chains. Today, consumers give increasing importance to the sustainability of the products, so transparency and traceability along the supply chains is really, really important and will become more important. That will create a competitive edge and it will surely require huge investments. Now in UNECE, as part of our normative work, our member states have actually adopted a series of guidelines and recommendations of how to make supply chains more transparent, more traceable, from a sustainability perspective. And investment will be needed to implement that. So I think that's the second important opportunity. Thirdly and lastly, let us look at the opportunities arising from the transition to a more circular economy, a key topic for UNECE, as I mentioned before. Clearly, also this will require huge amount of investment. And frequently investments in infrastructure, which are challenge, uh, challenge channeled through PPPs, public-private partnerships, as a key vehicle there. Now here UNECE can offer our well-established guidelines and our pilot-tested evaluation methodology for people-first PPPs for the SDGs. So I think this also offers a highly relevant entry point. Now in sum, I see different opportunities, GVCs, the trade and investment linkages, supply chain traceability and transparency, and infrastructure investment for the circular economy. And as UN entities together with the RCs, I think we can join hands in helping countries harness these opportunities. That means improving the evidence base, developing concrete policy options, supporting countries in the implementation. And here I think the UNCTAD action plan and also the investment policy framework for sustainable development. They are clearly benchmarks and tools such as the UNECE guidelines on PPPs and the UNEC guidelines on supply chain traceability, they very much support this and can go in the same direction. So from this perspective at UNECE, we are delighted to engage, we are delighted to join hands and to collaborate with UNCTAD and with other partner organizations to help countries achieve the key objectives of harnessing investment for the SDGs and for the circular economy transition. Many thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you very much for that overview. I think 
we have uh, we've really had a um, an overview globally of what's happening in um, regional integration across various continents and um, we have little time left but i would like to ask uh, a question and i would go to mr singh please if i may um, because i've had the impression uh, looking at the different uh, processes on different continents that um, ASEAN, if it comes to uh, regional integration through FDI, is among those that are traveling at a faster speed. Um, is that fair to say, Mr. Singh? And if, if that's so, what are the, what are the factors that really uh, that make the difference in your view? Thank you, Richard. I, I, I do agree. I mean, the facts speak for itself. I think the quantum of FDI that uh, ASEAN has been able to attract for the last many years shows it. I think outside of the United States and China, we are probably the largest recipient as a region of FDI in the world today. And um, and I guess I guess what pulls the 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 togetherness in this in this stride is the fact that I think most of the economies. Most of the economies are young economies in the sense that they have young population, uh, they have huge uh, demographics uh, of uh, growth, uh, but at the same time, they have populations which are embracing technology and change. And there's a huge, uh, there's a huge appetite of uh, wanting to make an improvement. I mean, even the populations um, are all looking towards better livelihoods, better lives. So it really does not matter which political party runs. Uh, whichever country in the ASEAN, I think whichever rulers or leaders that come to power, they all are actually deeply committed towards wanting to strive for um, uh, openness, wanting to help betterment for their people, wanting to make sure that uh, there's development and growth and an attraction of uh, FDI to their countries. So I think that consistency is what has helped uh, the entire region to come together and bind together quickly. And I think that's that's our biggest strength today as a region. I think there's a certain consistency of policy making, and I think, like I say, it doesn't matter who's in power. Uh, there's a certain uh, streak of uh, of embracement of uh, of good uh, investment policy making that takes place in, within the ASEAN member states, and and that's very helpful for bureaucrats like us. You know, uh, we work hard, but at the same time, we know that's a huge uh, committed uh, political power behind coming from the ASEAN member states who push for this. Yeah, so that really is important. Okay, thank you very much. That, um, it's, um, it is helpful to know it's, uh, it's pointing all the, all the noses in the same direction is, uh, is the biggest, one of the biggest factors behind this. Um, if I move to um, uh, Latin America, Mr. Caicedo, I, I, I listened to to the speech of Mario Castillo, and, and it sounds, I mean, the last few slides were like a huge to-do list, right, for the region. There's a lot of work to be done there. Um, what's, what's your, um, do you have any take on that? What's, um, what is your view as to the, the prospects for regional integration through FDI in the region? Yes, uh, the, uh, thank you very much for, for the question. Uh, definitely, we have uh, some challenge in the future, but uh, within the two or three things uh, we need to do in the future. First, uh, harmonization of uh, incentive policies and attraction. Uh, secondly, uh, probably we need to work uh, more in cooperation in the area of competition policies to attract investment and uh, legal stability. Uh, third, uh, we think that uh, we need a uh, to work in coordinate design and implementation of uh, sectorial or horizontal policies uh, with the idea to improve uh, the contribution of FDI according to the objectives of the region. We, 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 we need uh, also joint actions to attract quality investment. Definitely, we need to, to work in some areas uh, with um, the objective to have a, uh, uh, policies uh, more uh, broad in order to, to identify these, uh, these fields uh, where we can to, uh, to obtain more investment for the region. Actually, uh, in the Indian community, we work in uh, different committees 
in order to, to identify possibilities to uh, implement uh, policies related with uh, investment, uh, not only in the area of policies, uh, but uh, promotion, because it's very important to, to link uh, two areas. Uh, in this sense, we think that uh, loan of, of work uh, for the next years in order to, to, to have more uh, investment in the region. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I have just time for a final question, uh, Mr. Jikic, if I may. Um, I would like to just um, come back to that final point you made earlier about um, uh, getting a view, an overview in the region of what are the incentives for investment and trying to bring a bit of harmonization. Uh, what uh, What is the, um, have we, we have now, uh, a big reform of, uh, of global international tax uh, happening. What is this going to influence the work you're doing on this front? At the moment, at the moment, at the moment, what we are doing is just the transparency provision to see where, where the measures are, uh, which, which are the measures, and then probably to go to go over with the harmonization. When I mentioned in harmonization, uh, you have to make in mind that we have to make the harmonization in line with the EU rules. As well as uh, all of the all of the parties are uh, members, potential or a candidate uh, for the accession to the EU. So basically, we have a twofold uh, watchdogs which are monitoring us. So basically, we're going to go into the, this direction. But it's uh, as you know, it's very hard in this region, which is, I mean, this is say some some still say post conflict. I don't want to call it like this. But uh, where, where the situation of the trust is not still such such developed as as in the other regions uh, where we saw, and that the integrations are uh, slowly starting to come in for the last five or six years, basically. As I'm speaking about uh, other areas than the trade, uh, this is something which uh, we where we think that we can have more more of the integration in the promotion aspect as well. Than, uh, than in the at the moment policy level. So Thank basically you very much. more in the promotional than in the policy level that we would have to go with this moment. Thank you so much. And, uh, and all very disciplined uh, on the timing front. I have one minute and I will wrap this up. Uh, thank you all so much for being with us and for uh, contributing your, uh, your knowledge, expertise, experience. Really appreciate it. Uh, I really hope that uh, certainly when it comes to my colleagues around the table, uh, that we will have a chance to work uh, close together in future on, uh, on investment, investment policy and on investment support to regional integration. I'm sure we will. Um, certainly with, um, with the regional uh, economic cooperation organizations, we, will, we are doing that. Um, Mr. Singh, we have a happy collaboration on the Asian Investment Report, which I look forward to, to renewing. And, um, uh, and, and certainly to, to see you on Monday uh, on this. Um, we have uh, technical assistance that we are carrying out with regional organizations on collecting investment data. So this is an, another opportunity for us to work together. And um, so there, there's, um, there's, there's plenty of, of, uh, of occasions there where uh, I think Stephen mentioned the investment guides that we are doing jointly. So we have a lot of, uh, a lot of touch points there. So with that, I, I close this meeting. Thank you all again very much for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you at the next World Investment Forum. Have a good evening. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Thank you very much.